Daffrey. Uh, he and I have a, a passion of basketball, then played for Lehigh University. A few years after me, <laughs> uh, I played at the University of Iowa um, in the uh, 70s, and then then Vin went went from there. Worked in corporate America. Got a got a feeling for the new new development of uh, software and and digital the digital age. Uh, what was it with what was the company then? Linux? No, not Linux. Lexmar, right? Lexmar. Lexmar. Yeah, Lexmar. Yeah, Lexmar. Uh, Vin is a father of three, right? Two boys or three boys? No, I'm actually father of one. One. Oh. Don't we feel like he's had time at three. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. how, how old is he? He's eleven. He just turned eleven Christmas Eve. Oh, awesome! Well, that gee, many crime. That's a great birthday to have. Holy cow! Yeah, for sure. So for let sure. me let me also uh, point out to our audience that uh, Vin has experience at, not only as an athlete at the college level, but after the Lexmark uh, situation and, and employment, you you started hanging out with academic advisors. And, and I think you actually know a friend of mine, Steve McDonald. Um, yeah, very well. And, and Steve and I worked together at uh, Colorado State University when I was uh, finishing up my PhD. And so we, you and I have a lot of, lot of bases we can touch together, some touchstones with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also am interested in knowing uh, more, not only about the curriculum that you've created for the, the sexual violence uh, prevention, as is, as is the title for the NCAA. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions about my sensitivity to the word violence versus assault. So let's start there. Why, why the word violence versus assault? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think what, so we're following the lead in terms of how the NCAA defines uh, their, new, uh, their new policy. Uh, and so what, and I would say that we, we don't want to be defined Purely around assault nor violence, uh, we're looking at this policy that the NCA came through with. I'm happy to chat more about that here. Uh, but that, as that came to life uh, this past summer, uh, we're looking at this as an opportunity not only to educate student athletes, their stakeholders, mainly coaches and administrators around sexual violence and sexual assault, but healthy relationships. You know, the ability to not only capture and draw a baseline, if you will, around certain discussion topics around violence and assault, but, but all the opportunities that athletes have to expand beyond just uh, the do's and don'ts uh, with regards to this topic, but, but really the opportunity to grow healthy relationships with individuals. Because as we know, right, athletes are looked to on campus as, as beacons, and, and that can be good and bad, and yeah. we want to take more of an optimistic, positive view on that. Well, and what, what, one of the things I like for the audience to know about Game Plan is web-based uh, program, and as Vin has said, there's a number of different components uh, of offering to educate in a number of different collegiate uh, areas of co college life for student athletes. Um, and th this particular piece is, is high visibility, especially with the NCAA coming out uh, last summer, and then uh, Vin, you you launched this component for your site in December of 2017. Um, but I want to point out that you're you're hit, you're putting rubber to the road. I mean, when when kids look at this, they're just, they're looking at other aspects of of what your game plan program could do for them. Everything from scheduling their classes, investigating other aspects of college life, uh, interactions. So when you say healthier lifestyle, you don't just mean in the, the confines of sexuality or intimacy. You're, you're talking about no. game plan, looking at all aspects of the collegiate experience. Yeah, yeah you nailed it. Thank you. Um, much more articulately than I ever would. It's, it's, it's the idea associated with everything that athlete is, is thrown at them in their, their time on campus. And there's a lot. Uh, the time demand an athlete goes through, and managing their practice schedules and their and their travel schedules, and, and the demands the coaches lay out, you know, in terms of sports performance, uh, the academic rigors. Uh, there's a social aspect which is they impact uh, that that culture of campus, which we think obviously there's discussion around uh, how they're they're managing themselves from a, uh, an awareness of sexual violence, sexual assault, and, and healthy relationships. So as opposed to treating that topic as, as kind of a silo, which we've seen it historically 
treated as, we want to bring this into the mainstream development of the athlete. We call it comprehensive student athlete development for a reason. We just like we want to help an athlete think about this after sport, we want to help them think about all the great transformative skills they're building as an athlete that will help them hopefully go on and have a very successful life after sport. Um, as well as all the experience they're going through on campus, we believe this is paramount. We believe this should be just fundamentally part of that discussion, just like time management is, and just like goal setting is, just like uh, getting the practice on time is. It, it should become part of the expectation of the development of the athlete. And as opposed to kind of managing it mutually exclusive to a lot of the other experiences the kids are going through, we want to pull those all together. And, and that's the design of the platform to unify that. Well, and with that that in mind, uh, Vin, I want to offer this phrase to you, what you said about life after sport and enhancing it during the sport is adding the phrase quality of life during the sport. Because you pointed out some very key things about the, the management of time the athletes have to deal with. Uh, you know, despite the fact that the NCAA says, you know, 20 hours maximum per week for, for sport contact, on a um, on a mandatory basis. Well, okay, fine. They put 20 hours of mandatory in for coaches and team and players, but then there's a whole bunch of hours that aren't accounted for that are involuntary, or that are you know, they're voluntary. I mean, that the players participate in uh, with direction. So you know, I've seen kids during the season put in as many as 50 hours a week towards their sport and their education. So um, I, I'm going to take this, uh, what, what's going to sound like a different direction, Vin, but the language that you use in the um, sexual, uh, preventing sexual violence for student athletes, do you, do you uh, norm that for social differences so that the, the vocabulary addresses uh, nuances from where kids come from about, you know, the relationship and, and how to manage those interactions? Yeah, so it's a great question, and it probably deserves a little background. This past uh, this past fall, we were very fortunate to begin a relationship with the National Basketball Association. Um, and as the NBA continues to evolve, one of the major investments that the NBA is making is into their developmental league, uh, which is now called the B League, which is Gatorade platform. Yeah, it's a phenomenal opportunity for uh, for young men to uh, really desire to go play at the, the highest of levels from a basketball standpoint, um, train up to get there. And and I think you're going to see the community continue to grow and really become prominent in the way of, if you call it a minor league system, it's, it's going to become a phenomenal, phenomenal system to, to prepare someone to go play uh, professionally at the, the highest level of the, the actual NBA league. And as we began that relationship, um, the NBA in a similar capacity as a lot of athletic departments, we're investing into uh, players' life after sports. And we thought this was really interesting. This is really our first foray into professional athletics. But, but what became clear is uh, they weren't doing this as a side project. They were very invested in helping players think through what life after sport looked like. And they came back for really two reasons. One was they knew the more that they invested into the current player, the better they perform as a player. Uh, and then secondarily, they looked at it as it's the right thing to do. Uh, so there's absolutely a business purpose because they actually saw players perform better when they knew that there was an investment, not just on their own core performance, but them as a person comprehensively, which we thought that was really fascinating to see that there was a business aspect associated with the development of the athlete, not just it's the right thing to do. And, and so we knew that. But beyond that, what was interesting is within our platform, we have the ability to create courses on demand. And the folks that we start to interact with when the NBA comes knocking are some of the best in the world. And, and we, we hit it off with a woman, Paluna Johnson. Paluna is the, the primary uh, lead for sexual violence, sexual assault, uh, training and education prevention uh, in the NBA. And, and so as we started working and developing courses for the community associated with this topic, Kalina became our subject matter expert lead. And, and following her lead and what she's done for years and years and years, working with not 
not just the MBA, but colleges as well as other professionals. We, our eyes were open to, gosh, this is phenomenal. And thus the reason why I kind of gave on that perspective that this needs to become mainstream into the education of every athlete, not yeah. just the MBA. Yeah. Uh, right. But Karima uh, is the subject matter expert that leads our content for our courses now, both at a professional level at the G League, but also at the collegiate level. So I wouldn't say anybody in the in the necessarily have the you know, the top the, the, the expertise to, to drive the type of content that we're delivering to student athletes. However, through really strategic partnerships like we have one with Kalina, that that changes the game for us because at that point in time we feel comfortable yeah. with delivering that type of content. Let me uh, let me ask you a long winded way of saying that so so to to address the, the unique circumstances of players uh economically, socioeconomically, yeah. absolutely, because it's rooted with experience of working at the professional athletic level. That, and then I want to follow up with an first of all with an administrative thing. Make sure, um, Vin, that you're not you're not moving around too much. If you if you and I'm not there with you, so I don't know if you're you're moving around with your phone or so stay stay uh, fairly stationary uh, because the signal wavers uh, when you move away from the mic or your headset or both. Okay, that's all right. Uh, we wouldn't know unless I said something. Um, I, I've done some background looking at uh, Kalima and, and her work. Uh, I'm actually going to promote uh, Break the Cycle uh, and the, the organization that she, sh she supports because part of what we do at Measure Up is provide education and insights on resources that uh, young people can take a look at. I also want to emphasize for our audience again that Measure Up is not about, uh, about women. It's about power and privilege. And I say that with best of intentions. I'm not trying to... Uh, diminish the woman's role. They, they need to be complemented for bringing an awareness, a greater sense of awareness to the issues we're talking about. But I want to make sure that we keep a perspective because uh, sexual harassment, uh, the differentiation and marginalization of people is not sex dependent or gender dependent. There are women on women, men on men, men on women that that create these per, these per, these perspectives and these attitudes. So I want to make sure that we're very clear on that, and that the the work that Vin Vin is doing, McCaff Vin McCaffrey is doing with his um, organization Game Plan, um, is taking a look at actually providing knowledge on, in the moment, in the experience. Not, I mean, I I I, I understand it was after this after the sport was part of the initial startup, but I'm really complimenting you on, the, especially at the college level, because now the NCAA, as I understand it, is mandating that the directors and administrative people, athletic administrators, they have to go through the course, right, Vin? That's correct. Just like with correct. the with drug and alcohol stuff. Yes. That's that's outstanding. Now, do you get the same compliance? With the NBA G League or any any other professional organizations doing mandating the same thing, or is it voluntary? Very much. No, no, it's it's uh, it's cost dependent. There's no question about it. Nice, uh, nice. The the league, the NBA office, the uh, we're now working with Major League Baseball. The commitment they have to the investment into their players is exactly what you're saying. This isn't there's a, there's an aspect of this obviously that uh, that is. is uh, it's educational and it's, it's delivering it because it's the right thing to do. But they're just they're 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 invested in developing an individual because it, it's it's helping them grow uh, as a player and as a, as a human being. And it's, and and they're already seeing the results. And so these things don't become voluntary at that point in time. They become mandatory. Uh, if you imagine going to a you go back to your Iowa basketball play days and say, Coach, you know the uh, you know, the foul shooting part of practice, I don't get fouled so much. I, I'm not going to, that part I'm just going to bail out on. That, that part of practice, yeah, I'm going to get a drink of water. Like, coach would go sideways on me. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, and yet, we're looking at certain topics that in subject matter with these athletes and, 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 and kind of looking and picking and choosing spots. And, and yet, I think what we're starting to realize is there's certain topics that just are my and, and there's a right thing to do. And, and the investment being made top down by the athletic department and the athletic organization, the league offices, et cetera, 
and and you know, so thus, yeah, there's a follow through from the players that they are they're going to go through this as well. Well, in, in what I'm very excited about is, is it's, it's not just a one and done workshop. It's it's a sustainable. Uh, educational model, right? It's progressive. It's well, building on itself. And I'm going to build on that. Yeah, but at the level, yeah, it's, it's going to grow. I'm going to build on that point, Ben, by by taking the time. I, this is the time we take a little bit of a break and promote some stuff. And one of the things I'm going to promote is the uh, break the cycle. Uh, that's uh, their phone number is 310-286-3383. And you can reach their website through breakthecycle.org. Now, this is an organization that uh, Kalima Johnson is is endorses. She that's her frame of reference to provide services. Uh, it's a, a a service for populations between the ages of 12 and 24. Um, it is um, it, it's it it takes it it takes a shot at these statistics. One in three teens will experience abuse in dating relationships, and two-thirds of them will never report it to anyone. Now, I'll add to that. I have interviewed 73 women from the ages of 19 to 62, and not one of them, not one of them could tell me that they were free of having an experience, a sexual experience that was irritating or violent. Uh, and that may sound redundant, but I wanted to get a degree of assault versus violent and I, that just uh, that just amazed me that our, our culture our world is such that that women have not don't have experiences where they're not violated in some way I just go my gosh I'm a man and I'm, I'm embarrassed by that it just I, so I just I know in my heart that in my gut that we're not educating young men well enough and I know that you have a son I have a son as well who's raising four sons um, and so I'm, I'm very much committed to sending the message, which is why I created Measure Up. The other, the other thing I want to make sure I promote today is um, the, a piece that connects. One of the other pieces we do here at Measure Up is we make connections between uh, resources and uh, educational support. And one of those resources that I've had the honor of creating with a colleague is called uh, the RMP. And it's basically a human desires assessment. And I use it with my athletes so that coaches have a better way of understanding who is the right person at the right time to substitute. Or for the athlete who has this insight, they know themselves deeper at a more organic level about what their desires are so they can manage those emotions with those desires with that information. Um, so when this particular uh, topic that we're talking about, about sexual assault and sexual violence, um, we have had uh, good scientific evidence um, to say that we can identify people who have the preponderance to not have the best control of their emotions in certain areas of intimacy and sexuality. Now, that doesn't mean we're targeting sex offenders or, you know, uh, pedophiles or anything that kind of thing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that everybody has uh, sets of desires that will create patterns of behavior. And many of us don't have the tools to measure what's the, what's the tendency for me to behave in a certain way. In athletics, when coaches can do more than just predict the tendencies of behavior, they can substitute the right defensive guys to go get a fumble or intercept a pass uh, and have the right combinations on the offensive line to create the openings for a running back. That's initially where I started using this data. But now as I've gotten more um, client base, both men and women, um, I identify strategies more specifically for helping these athletes to manage their behaviors and control their emotions in very positive ways uh, to optimize uh, human behavior. So that's called an RMP. You can find it on my website at 360mindset.com. We're talking with Vin McCaffrey. Vin. Do you have any family in the Denver area? Uh, no, no, uh, not directly. Okay. There are some family members. Uh, my father's grandfather. Uh, there's some McCaffrey family uh, that had spawned out of Philadelphia many, many years ago that played some football out your way. No and, way. Uh, really? Those places as well. So it's kind of like you. You're the typical Irish Catholic, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a couple of degrees of separation. It's uh, a big clan. So any, uh, oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, so any family, uh, you know, come back all the way from Philadelphia out to Allentown, which is you know, before we went out to 
Stanford. Yeah, uh, yeah. His youngest brother and I actually grew up together, Mike. And so uh, we looked at each other, more, although we weren't related technically, we were more buddies uh, growing up playing basketball in uh, South Jersey, Philadelphia area uh, as kids. So small world for sure. Uh, I wouldn't claim, I'm sure they wouldn't claim me a family. <laughs> they were not to them, but uh, but great people and uh, it's a phenomenally successful what they've done. Yeah, Ed, and I've had the pleasure of, of meeting Ed and talking with him and uh, and as well as Christian and the people that support Christian here in uh, mm -hmm. Denver with training and what have you. But you may not know this, but he is nominated as one of the five rookies for the uh, Pepsi next NFL Rookie of the Year finalist uh, from the Carolina Panthers. So. Christian's on the list. And so that must be at the recent announcement. That's great. Yeah, that came out today. Uh, today at 1.05 p.m. Uh, uh, New York New York time. And the the fans will vote these guys in. Uh, so one of these five guys will be voted in by the fans. And all you have to do is go to NFLcommunications.com uh, and uh, look for the, the votes or just NFL. Dot com and you'll find where to vote for the uh, the Pepsi Next NFL Rookie of the Year 2017. And uh, the, the complete list is Alvin Kamara of New Orleans, the New Orleans Saints. He's a running back. There's a lot of running backs on here. Christian McCaffrey of the Carolina Panthers. Uh, Kareem Hunt, a running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. And uh, Leonard Fournoy, uh, or Fournette. I guess they want to make it four because there's a Fournoy, so it's Fournay. Fournay, I think is the way French pronounce it. Leonard Fournay, uh, a running back from Jacksonville Jaguars. And lastly, a cornerback. Defense gets represented by Marshawn Lattimore of the New Orleans Saints. So that was my, my lead in to, to pub the NFL. But oh, very good. I figured as a McCaffrey, you could vote for one 11 year old boy that will be doing a, a vote from our house. Today. Yeah. I'm very sure. Just that. rock it. Get on the keyboards and go for it. Uh, so now yeah, right, yeah. we're in our next we're in the next segment where we talk about what are some what are some of the skill sets you know the outcomes that you want to see student athletes uh, derive and put to put to action once they go through uh, the training segment on the game plan website. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. When you think about the athlete experience, I, I just the quick uh, quick here is. When the business started, it was the idea of helping an athlete go get a job. And, and because of all the transferable skills that athletes have, and that secret's out of the back, right? Uh, employers love athletes for a lot of reasons. What we've realized is one of the major reasons these athletes go be very transferable teams is their schedules on campus, uh, as you alluded to earlier, are insane. They're yeah. incredibly yeah. demanding. And when you walk them through, we literally walk around with the athletes just to go by a half hour by half hour increment. You know, a 50 to 80 hour commitment on a weekly basis is not uncommon. Uh, and that's all up, right? That's travel, that's those are meetings, those are uh, study hall, they're, they're obviously the sports performance session, uh, you know, the, the, the mandatory uh, meals, the meals routine. But what you realize is there's, there's no give in those schedules. And and I think that's a big part of what actually develops these transferable skills because the, the, the kids learn how to manage their time and not just manage their time, but do it so effectively where they're able to go out and, and perform. And so we see that as a major outcome. So if we can help them inside of that, make that a little bit more efficient, if we can give them a few hours back here and there, that's really valuable. Uh, but at the same time, we know we're going to help them hone that skill, which is a lifelong skill. We know, for example, that, that employers love the athlete's ability to communicate. And that doesn't mean just talking with each other. Primarily, that means that, that an athlete really just receives feedback very well. Uh, as an early entry into the workforce, somebody who's just college, graduated college, that 22, 23, 24 year old. How important is that, right? That's to actually be these directions and be able to go out and do a task. It sounds a lot like an athlete gets day in, day out on campus. So we're helping them understand that in a very tangible way of what they're going through as an athlete and helping them understand what that looks like in the first three to five years post graduation, right? So we want to be able to make that very explicit to them. Um, and then 
one of the biggest part is so there is kind of general transferable skills, right? but the, the biggest part is we want to help them just get a very specific self awareness of themselves. Uh, we have an assessment instrument uh, as an example, and this is all the Genie guys as well as the SEC, help them understand their athletic identity. What are the key characteristics that make them tick as an athlete? Uh, I myself, I'm high in structure. So what does that mean? If you get in a, in a structured environment, I'm probably going to perform a little better than a relatively unstructured environment. You know? On campus, that means my grades went up during the season versus the off season. Uh, you know, off campus, when I'm graduating and moving to the workforce, uh, if I'm a structure that's highly tight, I know exactly what I need to do in environment, I'm going to perform a little better than I would be in a the environment. And, and those are really valuable tools for a young person to become aware of because it's, it's lifelong. Those aspects of their personality are really not going to change. They'll evolve, but that's their DNA in many respects. And, um, and that's what comes to life inside the platform for them. So, so if we can give them those tangible elements as they make the transition, we think we're in a really good place to help. You know, and just bring them to life. So, Vin, in the uh, in the platform, does it have an assessment so that it measures the retention or understanding of the material that the, the student athlete has just gone through? It measures the usage, and it does measure the retention of what they're going through. Okay. We also have personality-based assessments, which is what I was referring to as yep. well. Yep. That's helping an athlete understand specifically that as well. So. So we have lessons that we're teaching, and we want to obviously make sure that they're that that's hitting them between the eyes. Right? That's, that's what we see. Now, on your connection, on your connection with the NCAA, do they ask you to um, give reports back to them, or do they share information with you about the the usability, reliability, and um, engagement? Of student athletes on campus because we're talking about 450,000 student athletes across 1,100 member NCAA schools. That's a that's a huge population. Big number. Uh, the way the NCAA developed their policy specifically around sexual assault, uh, it's it's designed so that they set out the policy that essentially campus makes their their ensuring that their Title IX and compliance associated yep. topic is enforced at the athletic department level. Um, but what needs to perhaps in a, at an instance you would know, make the athletic department unique versus general campuses, every athlete every year needs to go through that form of education. And then the, the, the chancellor or president of the university, as well as the athletic department director, as well as the Title IX compliance over athletics would report back that every athlete, administrator, and coach went through that training annually. So they're not necessarily getting the, the granular data of what all they're going through, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to ensuring that uh, each each campus is essentially compliant with the policy that they've done it. And, and all the senior members of the leadership team are signing off that yes, that's been done. Yeah, because there, and as you just mentioned, the senior leadership of the team, there's an organization within the NCAA called SAC that um, it's the student athlete I think, conference or council, which basically every sport, at every every sport picks an athlete to represent themselves on that council. I'm I'm just hoping that each university um, not only uh, is serious about this issue, but is serious about the connection of distributing the education, following up on the education, as you just said, every year the students get an orientation about it. Uh, because as I've got in my hand here, in addition to talking about Kalama Johnson and the Break the Cycle fact sheet for uh, resources, uh, Major League Baseball and the Major League Baseball Players Association, um, they addressed, uh, Paul Hagan did a report for uh, MajorLeagueBaseball.com uh, regarding the uh, comprehensive policy that reflects uh, the commissioner, uh, Rob Manfred, uh, said that they believe these efforts will foster not only an approach of education and, for, and prevention, but also united stance against these matters throughout our, our sport and our community. So that statement right there is to your point about beyond the sport, you know, developing great young people, great young men uh, and women. Uh, and then Tony Clark, who's the, one of the executive directors with Major League Baseball Players Association, 
um, he went on to say that players are husbands, fathers, sons, and boyfriend, and as such want to set an example that makes clear that there is no place for domestic abuse in our society. Now, there's a phrase by, by Tony where he adds domestic abuse. Now, that's a form of assault and violence, uh, but doesn't necessarily represent the comprehensive nature of all sexual or um, types of assault. But not, the point's still not being lost. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so the Major League Baseball is, is making a more, fair, I would say, if, as equal to or greater a definitive statement towards uh, the same thing the NFL has starting to do. And you, and you mentioned, Vin, you're working with Major League Baseball as well? We are. We're just beginning that relationship now. Yeah, so in a similar capacity. Now, we're working with the league office, not necessarily with the players union, but the league office are going to see a lot of equal commitment, especially the Thomas Day. Yeah, well, sure. if at some time you need any help with player association, I've got a few clients that are their team representatives uh, mm -hmm. to the to the league. So you can get some uh, from the street, from the mound, from the diamond kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, let me point our our audience to uh, a New York Times magazine. Um, uh, it's a whole it's a whole magazine for December seventeenth. The cover is she said. And uh, it's an interesting cover. It's uh, she said on power and sex in the workplace, and one of the um, in this case with student athletes, the workplace is campus. It's their playing field or or court. Um, one of the articles is the reckoning on power and sex in the workplace. Um, it 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 just amazed me again my statistic about how many women well all the women I talked to had experiences. Um, and, yeah. and in these articles in the New York Times, so I'm just asking people to take a look at that uh, New York Times magazine. It's, it's all about uh, the movement. So that's where I'm going to take the question with you, Vin, is, okay, Me Too. It's the Me Too movement. And I'm, I'm still trying to understand so I can educate effectively and, and affirmatively to other men, what is it? What are you hearing from the, your the, the, your constituents, uh, people like uh, Kalima and others? What are they saying to us about what the movement is and what we can do as men to help sustain the movement, participate in the movement? Um, I, I've I've had women say to me, "You're a guy. Your your words don't mean anything. It's only the women who can talk about this." And I, I, in initial, I got a little offended. I kind of went, but, 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 I have a daughter, you know. I want to help her. What have you been hearing? Yeah, you know, obviously sensitive, right? So you know, instances like that, it's, it's tough to kind of use one example and, and make it the other rule. Yeah. Um, the, the she said movement um, is, is obviously proliferating around society, and and that's clearly taking form. As part of our education with with the athletes that we're working with, uh, but we also know it's just it's part of the discussion that's that's occurring on campus. But that being said, if, if you're kind of taking the frame of uh, you know if I'm working with men in particular and I'm trying to educate them on how can they help this cause when they feel like they might be uh, slighted a bit here, uh, I think it's an educational view of understanding where a lot of this is coming from and. And to be very honest, I think what you're kind of bringing up is, is a key factor. I don't know if we, if we as a society have a full sense for the, the breadth of the challenges that we're seeing, right? These are real numbers. These are real statistics. Yeah. And, uh, and it's really, really alarming when we start to get into the, that data. Uh, and it, it's not, it, it, it helps to brush away a lot of the, uh, the myths that exist out there around the subject matter. And, and what we want to do is kind of pull away the anecdotal and, and go more to uh, the statistics, but not make this a statistics scorecard, but help understand and educate male and female athletes yeah. around why this is so important to them and, and what is happening in society. And I would say that this kind of a lens that we look this perspective of positivity, we take the perspective of you're not guilty until proven innocent. We take the perspective of uh, that athletes are a, a beacon on campus. And frequently, you'll see whether it's, we're talking about sexual violence and assault or academic challenges or any other type of 
blue ones that has a negative reflection of it, acid scenarios get blown out of proportion. And that, that, that's been shown to be true. That, that occurs. There's a lot of different uh, examples. Well, and, of that. And Vin, let me let me ask you to consider this at that with that point, because you know we're we're focusing in on uh, what the NCAA wants to prevent, which is sexual violence and assault. But there's also before that happens the buildup in a setting, a party, uh, a private gathering, uh, and and there's there there's a sense of fun and laughter and happiness. Uh, but then with other influences that might go awry. So the, the separation between intimacy, assault, and violence becomes very, very thin. And it's to the point, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use this piece of music as, a, as an example of what, what, what kids are hearing out there. And this is my time, not yours. But just listen to these lyrics, you know. It, and, and where where does it stop? Because as you know as well as I do, we're guys and women are women, and there's different hormonal differences. As we learn about this in school, I hope we know there's still a desire for women, a desire for a man. What, are we going to lose that? Are we educating kids, student athletes, about the differences and role playing when those differences step over a line that you should not go to? Or are we just going to focus on, and I, we should, I'm not just dis dismissing it, just, are we just going to focus on the, the violent, you know, horrific assault aspects of it and forget about the intimacies and the, 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 because I look at, I tell my son all the time, and he's got as a father of five. I tell him, guys are stupid. We haven't been taught anything. Women have soared way beyond us into the realm of cognitive dissonance about emotions and feelings and 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 being in touch with it. Most of us guys, we're just kind of like, you know, uh, whatever. So I'm I'm just wondering if our education is going to put some of that in so that. The young people have an idea of where the the boundaries are and where the separations yeah, are. So, well, I think you're bringing up a wonderful point, and, and I think this goes to the point that I was sharing earlier. This discussion around the education of an athlete, uh, they, much like college students in general, when you start talking about career development, I'm just using this as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. There's there's many people that feel like getting a college degree and getting a job are mutually exclusive events. Uh, where I'm going to go out, I'm working my tail off to go to college, I'm going to get a degree, and that's phenomenal. And then when I'm, I'm going to then go get a job. And, and we look at that as those are absolutely tied to the hip. We're now taking the same very approach with our, our view and our vision and our mission, frankly, of, of helping athletes understand in a very comprehensive way all the development op opportunities in front of them. And so, from the from what you just shared with your as you can share with your son and grandson, uh, I don't disagree. But in the past, maybe there was a lack of education associated with this topic, and that's no longer the case. At least for these athletes, we're going to provide very specific, intentional education for their unique circumstances. It is unique, just like we talked about before about their pressures and their schedules. And there's a lot of other pressures that are going on here too. That they're in spotlight, uh, they're, they're well met, and all of those are accounted for. But we are going to provide an educational opportunity for them to to address this. Uh, this is not if, if an athlete uh, takes our courses and, and there's several of them that progress across a four-year curriculum, they're going to they're going to be in a better spot to make better uh, better judgments, to make better decisions. Uh, if a non-athlete were to take our courses, uh, I think they would gleam a lot out of them. But they are designed uniquely for the athlete experience. Uh, there are circumstances in there that would probably wonder, huh, what's that all about? And, and yet, if the athlete were to say, oh, yeah, that happens to me all the time, that, that's where we click. So we're on the same level playing field with the athlete, but now we're providing very specific education to address this. And, and I think that's... Let's, let's be honest. I don't know if that opportunity for the athlete, young, 
you know, a check the box type workshop that has done has been done in the past mm -hmm. is really been widely available. And 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 if it has been, and I and I know that they have been, there's some unbelievable leaders in this space that have done that. Um, but but if we were able to tie this to the overall student athlete experience, um, athletes understand that as the expectation, uh, just like and I'm moving this in a very specific way, just like practice, just like going to study hall, these things are up for discussion. As they go through our courses, neither are they. And, and if it becomes the expectation, we'll move the needle here. You know, it's, it's just making sure that the natural resources of the education are in place and the buy-in for the bright people on campus are in place. I, I really feel good that we're, I don't think we have it all figured out by any stretch of imagination. So don't, I, I don't want to like paint the picture of the public, hey, this is all figured out. You know, don't worry about this, let's move on to the next challenge. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we're, we're absolutely moving in the right direction. Uh, that that we're, 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 this group of athletes that are in college right now are going to, in, in relative to this topic and subject matter, are going to look a lot better than the past generation. Well, and that's, that in itself is something to be applauded. Um, and I'm also interested as to where we go uh, underneath that, because that's a, that's a segment in that that's that uh, co collegiate group, that 18 to 25 group, and I'm I'm interested in in knowing um, wh where because we've got middle schoolers and high schoolers that are they're they're so sharp socially, you know they they're because we give them access to so much information. I'm wondering how early can we start sharing the knowledge about I mean relationships look at i i don't know about you when you're in high school but getting a girlfriend was the least thing on my mind because i was focused on uh farm work and my sport and getting a's that those are my three priorities in high school and yet i had fellow teammates on basketball and baseball teams that were constantly having waving at their girlfriends behind the backstop or you know dribbling down the floor on a layup drill and you know giving a wink to the girl in the stands and that so everybody, there's a lot of differences, but that doesn't mitigate the fact they need understanding. They need knowledge. You know, it, it's the days of assuming that a, a boy gets a girl's attention by grabbing her hair and pulling it, or a girl gets the attention of a boy by punching him in the arm are gone. Mm -hmm. And and I, I'm just I'm just wondering what's what's the future look like for game plan as it relates to a cross section of of. Uh, demographics for age yeah well right now we're we're squarely focused on the college athletes uh out through i call it an early alumni status mm -hmm. you know, the 22 to 27 year old segment um we're equally focused on the professional athletes and that has you know that that brought, that that range uh, is a little different right you know depending on the sports and, but that it falls into somewhat the same segment uh Interestingly enough, the uh, the G League, if you look at the demographic of the G League player, professional NBA basketball player in the G League, uh, by and large, they're a little younger than the average college basketball player. So yeah. you need to see that. Uh, one of the, the key aspects, I think this is where technology plays a really innovative tool here uh, in the discussion here, uh, like, like the She Said movement uh, is a fantastic example. How fast is that going right now? And, and yet, I mean, it's incredibly relevant. Um, you know, with the age of social media, uh, what was discussed yesterday was, was last year's news versus, uh, you know, what's coming down the pipe at, at any given moment. With our technology, you know, because we believe that if you really want to create a sustainable engagement with the athlete, that needs to not just be one touch. There needs to be multiple touch points with the athlete in a somewhat of a continuous way. And so if we're able to keep our educational content fresh, um, there's a huge value associated with that. We like, uh, we believe seven to nine minutes uh, as, a, as a course uh, is better than, uh, you know, 10 or 20. Uh, let's get it out. Let's get, let's deal exactly with attention span. Let's really get focused on how the individual works. Because the reality of it is these, these athletes are busy, and we need to be able to understand that. So when you think about our technology medium, we need to account for all the demographic information and the dynamics of the athlete uh, as we're going through it, and, and make sure that one, the technology is there, two, the subject matter is relevant, 
uh, in a, in, at an expert level, but it's fresh and then it's, and it's relevant to the day and it's topical. And, and that's something that just media provides for. Um, and and it's, that's exciting because as an athlete's coming in, and you shared earlier, and they're, they're picking their class schedule and they're looking for jobs. Uh, we're also educating them on sexual violence and sexual assault prevention. Uh, in the same, very same place, we're unifying that discussion. Uh, so we're never really going away from it. And, uh, and that's how we think we're going to succeed. Awesome. So it's not, as I said around here, it's not just, there's no silver bullet here, right? There's, yeah. But there's a lot of red ones. Well, and, and that's, I, that's our approach. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a thought that I've, I've used with a couple of clients about social media uh, because it goes to the base of what I do in, in making connections between people and things. And when you when we've got these these young people out there, e even in their twenties, the 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 millennials, the uh, I wires, and the Z generation kids, they they like that competitive nature of what social media can bring them. You know, you've got these games where they can go around and, and find stuff. You know, they get clues and they can walk around their neighborhood and do kind of do stuff. So I would suggest that on the social media connection side of things with game plan for any generation is that you one creates a, a reward through the gaming process. Like it, when someone could provide an example of how they engaged with a, another person, man or woman, uh, in a way that was, that was outlined and promoted in the instruction uh, so that you've got that comparison. Hey, they actually applied this stuff. You know, it's kind of like uh, Bloom's taxonomy. I get new knowledge, I apply it, and I get results. You know that kind of stuff, and many times education, um, it, for me, gets it, it gets lost in the completeness of the cycle. But you can do you can do it much faster with media, uh, so that you can give the yeah. kids the experience on your website and say, okay, take what you just learned, go out into the world and apply this new knowledge, and then we'll give you a reward for that. You know, maybe we'll give you a little sticker on, on your <laughs> on your phone you app or that. something. Yeah, you get a badge. You know, heck, I get a badge on my my phone for walking, whatever, and I I get all thrilled about that. And, and no, I can't spend it, but or you know, but there's so yeah. much of that yeah. going on. The role in our world, our badge is, uh, you know, everything that an athlete does in our platform is captured inside of what we call their portfolio. So if you're a downstream, you know, you're an athlete with one of the universities that we're working with, mm -hmm. going for. Uh, we go through any of our educational tools. We're capturing that in our portfolio because we know that employer really wants to see that. How how phenomenal is it that an athlete not only goes through the, the traditional athletic experience, right? Like practice, game, training, yeah. et cetera, but now they're trained on the education of, of sexual violence and healthy relationships. Uh, if that's not brought up in the interviewing process, it's a, it's a huge miss by that kid. Well, and that's where that's where you get the academic advisors engaged in it, the coaches engaged with it. I know when I was checking classrooms uh, and helping the staff with that, I was constantly talking to the athlete about what are you gaining from this? What do you perceive you're getting from this? I don't want to bug you. I don't want to hold you accountable for this. But if you don't, if you're not in class, you lose something. So, but they've got to figure it out. They've got to have the, that it's their idea and why it's benefiting. But at the same time, we also realize they're 18 or 22 year old human beings that yeah. are busy and have a lot. And so we want to make sure that there's a bit of a catch all. There's that safety net on the bottom where the beauty of unifying education and assessment with within our platform, with that, that means with career. Uh, and we also have a, a virtual mentorship tool. So it's like a three legged, a three legged school. As you pull all those together, it's really powerful. So if that kid's gone through sexual violence training and healthy relationships training, and we have uh, courses and a curriculum around financial education. You know, are those germane to every interview? No. But but if I'm looking at, it as a candidate and on a level playing field, I, I see that this individual has gone through that type of training and invested in their, themselves personally that way. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, that, that's a well-rounded individual. That's somebody I want on my team. Well, and, and we know that. And as uh, as a, as a sports performance, exactly we want to give it to the employee. And as a sports performance person during the season when they're there, I want to make sure that their environment's well managed. And many of them lose track of their financial responsibilities with their stipends. 
and they do they do crazy things with them. And so when we when I can point them to tools that will help them manage that and stay away from frustration and embarrassment as a result of not managing it, you know, and, and having to come crawling back to the uh, the admin uh, coach, you know, the ops coach, and say, oh, can you help me with a side job so I can get some money to go buy groceries? And, you know, and then they get the, the talking to about, you got a stipend, yada, 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 why didn't you take care of it? Uh, so, yeah, so th in our final few minutes, I want to make sure I cover a couple of things. One, to remind everybody that you can check out Game Plan and the, and the programs that Vin has talked about on We Are Game Plan. That's we, W-E-A-R-E, gameplan.com, and check out all the modules. In addition to the uh, newest edition, um, as of December of 2017, the uh, Sexual Violence Prevention Component, which has which follows the NCAA guidelines for the very same topic um, that, uh, that came out. Uh, I had my sheet here. i tell you when it came out. Uh, in August of 2017, that was when it was adopted. For all of the athletes in the 1,100 schools that are a member of the NCAA. Uh, in addition to that, I want to remind you again of the uh, Break the Cycle that is a, uh, a center for helping youth, empowering them to uh, fight and end domestic violence. Uh, their phone number is 310-286-3383 at breakthecycle.org. Um, that's a, a place that can give anyone from the ages of 12 to 24 some help on ending the cycle. Um, I want to make sure that uh, I give you a chance, Ben, to tell us a little bit about what's, what colleges are you currently working with routinely that has the game plan program in, in place and, and utilizing? Can kind of share some stories with us? Of course, yeah. Thank you for asking. So we're, uh, we're over 60 uh, Division I athletic departments around the country. Uh, about 50% of the Power 5 schools use our software. Um, and then uh, the balance are Division I uh, non-Power 5, which or group of five, and, and you know, we have a lot of different terminology to it changes every day uh, when you try to keep up with it. But the, the athletic department that use our software is not team by team, it's actually an athletic department. So, so we work with uh, men's and women's programs mm -hmm. uh, administratively. They, they use the entire platform across all their student athletes, which is exciting. So, you name it, those, those types of institutions are working with us. Uh, the, the great pioneering schools in the, in the way of of student athlete development, and, uh, and we're excited. That, and then, as I shared with you earlier, we've also branched out to work with uh, professional leagues now as well. Yeah. So, and at the college level, you are also uh, talking with N4A, the Academic Advisors Associations. Um, are you working with the Ac uh, the Athletic Directors Association as well to get with NACTA? Yeah, with NACTA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's interesting with us, if you just use uh, an athletic department as a, as a use case, um, we'll, work, we'll work initially with the, the student athlete development professional. That's the, that's the academic advising unit, that's the life skill unit, and their big power using the our software working directly with student athletes. Uh, but when we launched the career services application, what we found very quickly is that the, the external group, Began working with our software. So, for example, we have the ability within Game Plan for us to not only bring in what we call a national employer, but we allow some of our we allow our athletic department to bring in partner employers as well. So those could be sponsors. Uh, you know, I know for example, like at Purdue Athletics, they've added over 50 new employers that are just localized to Purdue. Mm -hmm. so at Purdue, those those employers are just being able to do that. Over thousands of jobs that are nice. localized to Purdue. Uh, so so that's you, a really cool use case for us because it expands beyond just traditional student athlete development. And all of a sudden, sponsorship teams get involved, uh, fundraising groups get involved because we see a lot of former alumni who are interested in, in investing back into the athletic department. They will frequently use Game Plan as a tool to be able to, uh, to share value where. The, that 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 alone might be interested in hiring former athletes in their uh, in their program. So it's a lot of different connection points within the athletic department. But it starts with student athlete development, but it certainly is expanded beyond that. 
do you um, work with my my alma mater, the University of Iowa? You know, we do not. Uh, and I will tell you, that's a sore subject with me because Coach McCaffrey was there. Yeah. Uh, and he's a, uh, a fine Lehigh, uh, former Lehigh basketball player. Yeah, Fran. Well. You know, Fran is doing a great job, but no, not yet. Well, so I, I, do, I got some connects. We're a great mindset around here, so it's a not yet, not a no. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I got connects. So if you need any help, let me know. <laughs> And then, I, 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 I'm, I, hopefully, we're on the record when I say I need help there. So yeah, I would more absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, say thank you so much for your time today. Um, and in doing so, I'm gonna turn up the background music with uh, the point we talked about with uh, "Baby, I Need Your Loving" uh, because I think we need love here too. It's not just about the violence and the hate that creates it, but We've got to make sure that we don't lose sight of um, why we're interested in it. It's because we love the, the experiences that we've had and we want these kids to have in their lives and making sure that they, they do good things uh, with their, their life after the sport as well as have a great experience during the sport. Um, Vin, thank you so much. Uh, this is 360 Performance Talk and the version of Measure Up. Measure up, managing the power and privilege between genders. Uh, we're committed to do that in providing education, like with what um, uh, <laughs> Vin McCaffrey and his uh, organization has provided um, athletes across the country, the 450,000 plus, uh, with his program, Game Plan. You can reach out to him at wearegameplan.com. Vin, thanks a lot. Have a great weekend and a wonderful 2018. Thanks, all. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, there we are, people. That's the end of the show. I got through it without too many octogenarian goof-ups. I'm going fine. That's the end. Baby, I need your loving today. Have a good one. Glad you're with me. Hope you're all having a great New Year's. But send me some uh, stuff over Twitter at Coach LKW. Love to hear from you.